today let me say um, a prayer before I begin Father in heaven your God your our God our rock our shield our hiding place I invite a presence here Lord as we meet for this class for this study I pray you take control I pray you lead ask your guidance ask your blessing Lord Jesus in you we live and move and have our being Lord stand by us Lord Jesus I will say thanks in Jesus name Amen continuing on where we left off last time lesson 2 continues prayer is very very essential in the life of the believer and the person who is called by God to lead the people of God has to understand the importance of prayer has to make prayer a part of his daily life his routine we are told in Ephesians 6 18 that we are to pray always using all kinds of prayer prayer is not just talking with God but it has to do with the needs the the situation that confronts the person all kinds of prayer the Bible uh, the Apostle Paul says here in Ephesians 6 18 with the Bible mentions um, supplication supplicating asking requesting you know stating the need to God the Bible talks about intercession prayer being made on behalf of somebody or something or a situation you really intercede and seek to intercept to block to prevent the sin back and the Bible talks about thanksgiving pray also in thanksgiving and the prayer or prayers should be full of the word you know the word of God the Bible the scriptures so the Apostle Paul says as we pray pray with all kinds of prayer not just say a little prayer and you don't even believe or you don't even know what it says just read it like a prayer but we are to pray all kinds of prayer pray without wavering right you shouldn't waver in prayer because the Bible says God is a spirit and they who come to him must approach him on a spiritual level you have to come to him in spirit and in truth the Bible goes on to say without faith it is impossible to please God you can't please God without faith you have to believe God is and that God is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him so you pray to God without wavering because God is true he's not like us God is not a man that he should lie he doesn't tell lie he doesn't say things he can't do we should understand that God is omnipotent we should have faith in his character God is omnipotent and because he is omnipotent we can have faith in him and ought to have faith in him we ought to have faith in his character we ought to have faith in him. his character is as true and as sound as his word if a person is a rum head a hard rum drinker were to come and tell you something you'll think twice before you believe or you make a move to do something that he tells you or you know and so on but when a person who is sound in character uh, talks to you and approaches you that's a different thing God is absolutely sound there's no flaw in his character God is God he's not a man that he should tell lie the Bible says so we pray without wavering and we are to pray in the name of Jesus we are told in Mark 9 38 to 40 pray in the name of Jesus because Jesus, the name of Jesus carries authority power the Bible says the whole Godhead that is the Father and the Holy Spirit 
were in Jesus Christ reconciling the world unto himself while he was here walking enduring the curses of people and doing good of course but enduring curses and threats and insults and so on the Godhead was in him <laughs> and who prayed more than Jesus whose prayer life can match his so there's something about prayer that we don't fully understand but one thing is sure we can believe God and do what he has requested of us to do that is to pray without ceasing and we pray in the name of Jesus because once our prayer is in faith and we are praying in the word and we are praying in the spirit and we are praying in purity that means we are clean our hearts are clean and we pray in the name of Jesus no power in the universe outside of God can block it not only should we pray in the name of Jesus but we should live in the name of Jesus the name of Jesus should characterize our, our lives as we go about our daily chores and duties and business and so on we should have the name of Jesus with us one song says have the name of Jesus with you child of sorrow out of woe you know understand that that's authority that's power the name of Jesus is really authority any situation you happen to come upon you call on the name of Jesus that's authority that's power you know, you know and uh, you don't need to swear and curse you don't need to call on Satan you don't need to call on any man any politician to help you right we have to live in him as the Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter 17 as he addressed the, the people the scholars and others and Mars Hill he said in Jesus Christ we live and move and have our being for he's not far from any one of us which means he is omnipresent and that is why we need to live in his name because he's really omnipresent you know is one place and everywhere else at the same time he doesn't have to run up and down to know what is going on as Satan has to the Bible says Satan we are told in Job that Satan said to God when he was asked where he was he said running to and fro in the earth and at times you come upon some difficulties and challenges and you might wonder why it is because Satan is on your heels is at your corner not just a demon especially if you're a threat to him and he's feeling your hand if the church your pastor is really praying and believers are fearing God and living right you are going to experience Satan on your heels he's not going to give up he's going to fight you harder is that some people do not understand and they think that every church is the same you know it, no, it depends on the mission of the church and the nature of the your ministry and the seriousness of your people and the seriousness of your ministry if as a pastor church leader whatever title you're under whatever level of authority you operate on but you're in charge of the church and you are serious about God you're serious about ministry and serious about holiness you are going to get a fight it does mean you will lose because once you're serious about God you'll win the war because remember that we are in a war with Satan the battle is not finished Jesus Christ crushed Satan and we were participants and beneficiaries but it, Satan has not been put out of action he has not been eradicated Satan still exists and he still has an awesome amount of power that God allows him to have but 
his power is circumscribed. He's not able to do what God does not allow him to do. But the power we have is not circumscribed. And the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 that his prayer was that the believers would come to know the glorious Father and the power the glorious Father exerted in raising Jesus from the dead. When you come to God, you know, come with a clear conscience when you come to when you're praying and asking God. According to 1 John 3, 20-22, come with a clear conscience. And you can only have a clear conscience if you have confess your sins to the Lord and you know you're really trusting God and your way is right in his sight and of course you know the Lord has made provision whereby the Christian can be cleansed the, 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 the work Christ did on the cross does not only save us but it has put provision in place whereby we can be cleansed constantly. We are told in John that if we walk in the light, as God is in the light, because remember that God is light, is the light of the world, and we walk in the light as God is in the light, we will have fellowship one with another. And not only that, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, I want us to understand that the, the blood of Jesus Christ is in what is known as a fountain. It's a spiritual thing. A fountain. This fountain filled with blood. And it is drawn from Emmanuel's vein. Now, so long as we are walking in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship one with another. But in addition to that, the blood from the fountain of Jesus Christ will cleanse us, will be cleansed constantly, right? We are being cleansed as we go along because unless that is taking place, you know, we won't have any power. It is not just a serving God is not. We should see it just as a human thing, as just a means of escape from hell to go to heaven while living here we can be victorious and we don't have to destroy ourselves mentally and physically to be to be victorious christ in his death has crushed satan and we were in christ crushing satan and also christ in his death gained victory over satan and we were in him, so we are beneficiaries. But not only that, the satanic nature that with which we were born, well, everybody was born with it, and that's what the Bible means when it says, all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. We're born with the satanic nature. That has been dealt with, not eradicated, it's still in us, but has been dealt a death blow. And what the child of God needs to do and must do is to reckon it dead and commit it to the Lord on a daily basis. The Lord, I commit my old nature to you, this nature that I have inherited from Adam, which was passed on to Adam by Satan. So I call it the satanic nature. Some theologians call it the Adamic nature. But I prefer to say satanic nature because the, that nature did not originate with Adam. God did not make Adam like that. So I do not call it the Adamic nature. I refer to it as the satanic nature or the flesh or sin in the singular. Because sin in the singular is different from sin in the plural. Sin in the plural are sins that we commit on a daily basis. But sin in the, in the singular is a sin we were born with. And that's what the Bible, Bible means when it says, for all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. 
So we ask, so long as we are walking in the light, as God is in the light, we'll have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ is constantly cleansing us from all sins. So we can come with a clear conscience when we pray. We don't have any guilt there. Guilt. Because we are constantly being cleansed. So there is no guilt. Right? We are constantly being cleansed. And as we pray, we are to pray in obedience to God's word. We have to bring the word to them. John 15, 10 16. It says, If we abide in Him and His Word abides in us, we will ask that which we will, and it shall be done. But we have to pray in the Word. In other words, if we are praying outside of the Word of God, which is the Bible, you know, we are asking for things that the Bible forbids us to ask about and ask for. There is no way that that prayer is going to be answered. We have to pray in the Word and we have to pray in the Spirit. Um, the Bible says that Samuel was praying for Saul long after God had rejected him. And God had told Samuel that he had rejected Saul. But he felt it. It was Samuel who had anointed Saul king of Israel and Saul was was a, his son in the face not his biological son but his son in the face young king and so on but, but Saul had a big problem and the problem was disobedience he was just a disobedient person he just didn't hear he didn't carry out divine instructions and God rejected him. And Samuel kept praying for him. God said to Samuel, Stop praying for Saul. Because I have rejected him. He had been there interceding for him, you know. But God said, Stop praying. It's, a, it's enough. You go and anoint somebody else. God sent him to God. And anoint one of the sons of Jesse. You see, listen, we have to obey God because we are not an, on our own, you know, we are not doing our own thing. We are working for God. It is God's business. It is God's ministry. And that is why I'm sorry for the churches that really box up the Holy Spirit. They try to tell the Holy Spirit what to, to do. They decide for the Holy Spirit what is to be done. They decide for the Holy Spirit what the deeds are in the church. They decide for the Holy Spirit how long the service must be. And there are members who foster that kind of culture in the church. That if church begins, say 10 o'clock, and it's to finish 12 to 10 to 11, 11 to 12, you must finish 12. And if it's service, say the Holy Spirit is doing a work and the service goes over to 12.15. They are not going to be there. I have known of many cases when people begin to leave. They so walk out and drive home and, and so on. So they, they said the church service is to finish at 12. You can't box up the Holy Spirit like that. Ever so often, I have gone to church prepared to speak a message and so on. A certain message that I believe the Holy Spirit gave me. Only to find that the Holy Spirit changes it. We have to be that open for the Holy Spirit to work. We have to be that open to know what the Holy Spirit is saying and what He's doing at a particular time. We have to be that open. We, we can't box Him up. It is, the Holy Spirit knows what He wants. It is His business. It is His work. It's not our work. We are instruments. And I really, I'm really sympathetic towards young pastors going out there, you know, and um, they're pastors 21, 22, 23, they don't even have beards, and they're going out there to pastor churches that have been established for so many years, and members are there, could be their grandparents, and parents, 
for you to change anything there is it's humanly impossible humanly impossible and churches that really hire pastors and pay them and see them as servants and hirelings you know they tend to dictate to the pastor and tell the pastor what to do I say that to say that I don't really believe that the lay people should be placed over the pastor it's not biblical sheep cannot lead shepherd it is the shepherd who leads the sheep that is biblical I am not saying that the pastor should have listened to members of the board in terms of administration in terms of the color paint to paint the church in terms of the tile to be don't you know change or so on that's administration but when it comes to uh, leading the people leading the people the pastor is the spiritual head and if the pastor ends up with a board that is carnal that church that pastor is going to have a very hard time the people are carnal and what they are doing suits them they love it they are not going to change pastors you have to clothe yourself in the Holy Spirit you know. pastors it doesn't matter your age how young you are if you know and you believe and accept that you are called by God to do pastoral work tell yourself your, your days of fooling around are over you can't afford to fool around you can't afford not to be sober because the enemy will take you down and take you out and the very brethren will turn, use the brethren against you the enemy will use the brethren against you you have to be serious you have to be clothed with the Holy Spirit as I look back in my ministry because I've been in, in ministry since 1975 as a youngster when I went into Bible college Bible college is part of ministry your ministry begins when you enter Bible college your ministry begins when you start this program of study in preparation for pastoral work or evangel to evangelist the work of evangelists and so on and I look back I wasn't I, I, I you know I really did cry those many years my prayer life wasn't up to standard it wasn't all I, I mean I, I prayed I made sure to pray every day at, you know say something but in terms of really trusting God and going to God by faith and looking to God and praying and really depending on him no sir it wasn't there I used to take things in my hands I used to be so proactive and so involved you know when you're trusting God and praying to God you need to take yourself out of it you know the battle is really his the ministry is his you are his you are an instrument it is God's work he knows what you don't know he knows everything you don't know anything <laughs> you, you, you don't even know the outcome of anything you have started you don't know what the outcome will be so you need him who is omniscient and you need him whose servant you are and whose work you're engaged in and he has made adequate provision for us to get the work done the provision to get the work done is adequate and so we need to be in obedience disobedience was what brought down King Saul disobedience was what brought him down and I've seen many believers and young pastors and so on taken down by disobedience the Bible says disobedience is worse than obia and if we are disobedient and we are praying and we are not abiding by his word hiding his word in our hearts and 
embracing his word and meditating on his word and appropriating his word we are not doing that and and, and yet we are calling on him praying to him we are not going to get any answer because of disobedience God stopped talking to Saul King Saul you couldn't hear from God not by a prophet not by vision not by Urim or Thummim or Aphod you just could not hear from God God was finished with him and so we see King Saul resorting to an obey woman a witch a, a witch he went to see her one night because he could not hear from God why he was a disobedient man and he always disobeyed God's Word he always trampled on the Word of God and as a result he was brought down so the disobedient person is wasting his time going to God in prayer you are not going to get any answer so let us pray in obedience to God's Word we are to pray according to God's will first John 5 14 to 15 what is God's will for your life have you thought of it what is God's will for your life has God called you in the ministry has God placed you where you are because you know if God has called for ministry and you are really in line and really in his will and in and obeying him God will take care that is a fact you are on his business and you are in his will you can be doing his work you can be doing his business and not in his will Saul was doing God's business but was not in God's will because he was not obeying God you know this is the prayer the Lord Jesus Christ taught the disciples which is a model prayer and it does mean that we are to pray we are to repeat that prayer each time we pray but it is a standard prayer by which we should benchmark our prayers right um, he prays he taught the disciples to pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is done in heaven we see the Lord Jesus Christ who is our example praying in the garden of Gethsemane and the Bible says he was being tempted to sin so much that he sweated as it were great drops of blood the Bible says he was resisting sin and the 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 the, 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 the test and the temptation that he was facing was to refuse to go to the cross it was the pain of the nails and so on that was the big thing for the Lord Jesus Christ it was the fact that your sins and my sins were going to be placed on him he who knew no sin was about to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ it was not easy for him but when we look at his prayer and examine his prayer we hear him saying not my will but thine be done Lord if it is possible let the cups pass from my lips yet Lord not my will but thine be done the Lord Jesus Christ prayed in the will of God we must pray in the will of God we must want the will of God to be done. We must pray like that. 
the will of God must be done. The will of God must be done. We have to pray in faith, faith believing. We have to pray in faith. Do you believe God when you pray? Do you lift your faith? Do you exercise your faith in Him when you're praying? You're not praying to just about anybody. When you, when you approach God. In John 14, 12, 2, 14, uh, tells us we must pray in faith. Right? We must believe that God is there and that God wants to help us. We have to pray in faith. When was the last time you went on fasting, may I ask? Is there a place of fasting? I know some church groups are against it. I don't know on what ground they object to fasting. And the Bible talks about some situations, some kinds that do not go out except by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Is there a place for fasting? When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. The disciples could manage. The Lord Jesus Christ responding, responded by saying, You unbelieving and perverse generation. How long shall I stay with you? In other words, Christ came to show us and demonstrate to us how to serve God and how to have faith and how to live right and how, how to access God's resources. As I came. So he said, how long shall I be with you? The time has come to take this thing and run with it. And young pastors and, and ministers and missionaries and evangelists, God has entrusted to you a sacred trust. And it works. It's full of power. And it is God's will for you to run with it. How long shall I be with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon. And it came out of the boy. And he was healed at that moment. The Lord Jesus rebuked the demon. And it came out of the boy. The same power and authority is given to us. If you read Matthew 10 and Luke 10, you'll see where the Lord Jesus Christ sent the, his disciples out and he gave them power and authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to raise the dead. The same power and authority is given to us. Right? Bring the boy to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy. And he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? They had been there trying. Jesus replied, Because you have so little faith. So they were trying nothing, but they weren't believing. They didn't believe it. Should I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, so long as it is in God's will, you know, and your life is right, the other, the other things are true. Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for you. As you go out there, as you prepare yourself, yourselves for ministry, and to go on the mission field, Go with that confidence. List the elements I've pointed out. Examine your life. Make certain that these are true of you. 
don't respond with one thing. You have to be living in purity. That means you have a clean heart. Because the Bible also says, if you have iniquity in your heart, God will not hear you when you pray. So make certain that you have uh, a pure heart as you approach the Lord. And you are exercising faith. It's very important that you do that and ensure that. We'll go on to lesson three, which says missiles used in spiritual warfare. Now we are in spiritual warfare. We are in a war. And you do not go to war without missiles. You don't go to war without ammunition. No, the spiritual ammunition is different from the secular secular ammunition and ammunition used by se people doing secular things. There are a number of Hebrew words translated praise. Are you aware that praise is a weapon? Is a missile of mass destruction? Are you aware that Satan and demons and it cannot exist in an atmosphere of praise? They can't. So we're going to look at a few Hebrew words here that are translated praise. Zamar. To praise with song and music. So singing is praise, you're singing from a clean heart, a pure heart, you're glorifying God, and you, you, you know, you use musical instruments, I don't know, some churches, some groups, cut musical instruments from their worship service, on the ground that, um, is not in the New Testament, <laughs> you, know, you know, people can take things to a level, really they can really take things to a level but music praise songs are all part of the worship process zamar you praise god with songs and music david was a musician and he knew how to worship god uh, with instruments is the same god god has not changed that hasn't changed you know is the same god Toda, another Hebrew word for praise, translated praise in English. You praise with raised hands. Praise with raised hands. In thanksgiving, you praise, raise hands. In thanksgiving, you raise your hands and praise God. You praise God for who God is, His holiness, His omnipotence. His righteousness, His justice, His love, His mercies. Praise Him. And when you create that atmosphere, things happen. Uh, we are told in Psalm 149 that we use praise to bind the enemies. Praise binds the enemies as fetters binds people. And we're not talking about the enemy, I'm talking about the spiritual enemy, Satan and his forces. It binds them up. It, it incapacitates them. They cannot uh, operate in an atmosphere of praise and thanksgiving. And that is why at times we feel so miserable and we feel to give up. But you praise the Lord. Yada. Another Hebrew word that is translated praise. Worship by the waving or throwing out of the hands. You worship by the waving and throwing out of the hands. You worship, and you praise, and you worship, and you give thanks and adoration to God, the Most High. You worship, you adore Him. No evil spirit can operate in that atmosphere. Can't. These are missiles used in spiritual warfare. Barak, another 
Hebrew word which is translated praise and it means to bless God for your prosperity God has prospered you do you remember when you were down and out you didn't have one cent to knock against another do you remember when you were in the valley at the shadow of death and you feared evil <laughs> do you remember that but now God has blessed you you are prosperous you have education life has improved you have a house and you have two houses you have paid off your house you have health you have strength you have blessed children children who obey you and they are doing well taking a stand in society holding their own and they are prosperous and they have been to universities and have degrees and so on you bless God for your prosperity bless him praise him thank him don't take your prosperity for granted your prosperity comes from God as one song says all good things around us are sent from heaven above so thank the Lord Oh, thank the Lord for all his love. Halal is another Hebrew word translated praise, which means to celebrate your forgiveness excitedly. God has forgiven you. He has set you free. He has knocked the gavel in the courtroom and said, go free. You had been charged had been found guilty but God has set you free has forgiven you has written off everything that was against you all the charges the charges have been dropped why could you why should you be quiet why should you allow anyone to hold you back and hinder you no you praise the Lord excitedly because you are forgiven. The songwriter captures it when he says, My sin. And he pauses. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, not a part of it, but a whole, is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. You praise the Lord for your forgiveness. Praise Him for what He has done for you. Praise Him for His goodness. Praise Him. You have something to celebrate. The charges have been dropped. You need to call your friends and celebrate. Here is where your, your, your testimony against currency and, and, and importance you were charged but though you have had your the charges dropped so you praise God I have heard people persons say that at times they can't find what to pray about and that therein lies the problem because they don't even they're not appreciative of God's goodness and forgiveness but they said they don't they start to pray they don't know what to pray and how to pray you know that speaks to spiritual bondage you know people are bound and sadly the devil has succeeded in binding many Christians because you would expect sinners to pray to that level we're talking about believers here. Believers are saying they can't find what to pray about. So you find that in the church, when believers are praying, or it's prayer meeting and so on, those who can't find what to pray about, stop praying and begin to disturb those who are praying and reaching out. We have to look out for that because that speaks of spiritual bondage and distraction. Shaba. 
Shout loudly for your deliverance. Shabba. You have those who talk about being quiet and you're worshiping quietude. You worship God in quietude. But why should you be that quiet when you are excited, excited about the work of God in your life, excited about your deliverance? You were once in the slave market. You were once being exploited by Satan. And Jesus Christ came in the slave market and stopped at your corner and saw your wounds and bruises, saw your sores, and he saw the bidding taking place in the slave market. He saw. This demon bids uh, a dollar for you. Another demon bids a dollar fifty. Another one bill bids a dollar sixty. Another one bids a dollar seventy. They didn't want to bid highly because, for by their standard, you didn't have much more to offer. No, you didn't have the value. You didn't have that which it took for them to pay a high price for you. But Christ came and he stopped at the corner while you were being auctioned on the block. And he bids also. He bids his life, his blood. Now, when he makes this bid for you, every evil power and authority becomes quiet because they realize that they are outbidded. They don't have the authority to lay their lives down and take their lives up. If they were to lay their lives down, that would be the end of them. But Christ Jesus has the authority to lay his life down and to take his life up. And he has laid his life down for us and has taken his life back and has come on our corner to rescue us from the slave market, from the grip and control of Satan and his forces. So we are delivered and we are still being delivered daily. It's a daily thing. Hence, we have a lot to shout for and to be excited about. Tehillah is the other Hebrew word for praise. Praise him by singing in the spirit. So as you go along day by day, you sing in the spirit, you worship in the spirit. You worship within you. You don't use your spirit time to meditate on evil and to gossip and to mischief. But you have a song in your heart and you sing and you worship God and you sing and you meditate and you praise Him. You know, you, if you live a life of praise, a life of thanksgiving, you will prosper. You'll prosper spiritually. And if you prosper spiritually, you will prosper financially. You'll prosper temporarily. Because the spiritual uh, dimension comes first. It is we are to give it priority. We must meet God's requirement first. We must put God first, and God is spirit. It takes a spiritual person to put God first. It takes a spiritual person to put God above self. And that is why the Bible says that any man who comes after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. One has to be prepared for that. God expects that. Worship is sacrifice, you know. One of the eight sins listed by Mahatma Gandhi 
is worship without sacrifice. People want, to, they'll come to church if it is easy, if it is okay, if they don't have anything to do, All right? But if they have something to do, if someone were to pay them a visit on that occasion, they can't come. You don't see them. They don't make the sacrifice. But serving God is sacrifice. He says you have to deny yourself. And you have to take up the cross, which speaks of death. Death to self. And it's a daily thing. You take up the cross and follow me. Missiles used in spiritual warfare. Don't miss them. Praises. It was praises the children of Israel used as they marched around Jericho. Remember they marched seven days straight and on the seventh day seven times. And there were the priests were leading the procession and they were using musical instruments. They were worshipping God, praising Him. And worshiping him and then they made a shout at the last uh, march at the end of it the end of the last march and the walls caved in the walls exploded the walls crumbled the city was flattened it's the same God same God of the Israelites the same God of yesteryear he is the God of today. He hasn't changed. He's the same God. Change your ministry. Examine these words and examine your life. What do you want to change in your life? Do you want power in your ministry? Do you want a powerful ministry? Do you want to experience God's anointing and grace and power? Do you want to see God at work? Change your ministry. Don't become a slave to what you have been taught in Bible college. Don't become a slave to theology either. Be your own man. Be your own woman. Know God for yourself. Begin to worship God in spirit and in truth. Begin to really see him as a source. Begin to worship him. Don't let anybody put you aside or silence you. Don't let anybody silence you. You put out. You worship. You get to know God for yourself. Get to know him for yourself. Know him for yourself. See how you can change your prayer life and your Bible reading. Begin to share what you have been taught with a friend, with another Christian. Begin to put in practice what you have been taught. And you'll see the salvation of the Lord. You'll see the difference. You'll see the change. For a change is coming. You can be changed. Don't be satisfied for, uh, be satisfied with a little, you know, surface experience, and you know. One historian has said, "For us to be as great as our four parents, we have to be greater. For they were greater than those who preceded them." We have to be greater than that. If we settle for just the knowledge they had, we won't be great. No man. God is spirit. And, we, and his revelation of himself to us is progressive. So we cannot just settle for that. We have to settle for.